now make our way into the main hall, the oldest part of Sandry Hall. Okay. Right, please okay. follow me, guys. Thank you. Okay, great. I can, I can already see something crazy hanging on the wall. You've seen that, Jay? What is that? What? Oh, the artwork. Whoa. This is insane. So, let's turn the clock back in time. The family that lived here and actually built the building were called the Southwests. Um, they were ardent Catholics. Uh, they fought for the king at uh, Agincourt, Flodden Field, but the writing was on the wall for this family in 1536 when King Henry VIII outlawed the Roman Catholic faith and anyone preaching Catholicism would be classed as a traitor. The South has refused to accept any other religion apart from Catholicism. As a result, this building was indeed a safe haven for Catholic priests. And we do have here at the hall two outstanding priest holes designed by a chap called Nicholas Owen. One is actually beautifully integrated into the fireplace. I'll show you that later on. We've also got one upstairs, which is indeed an optical illusion. If the beams could talk, they would tell you some amazing stories, uh, an amazing event that really did take place here. Yeah. Um, sadly, the South was because their love of Catholicism, it was going to cost them dearly. Uh, the army were always watching them, but a priest was found in the little chapel here. Uh, he refused to hide, sent down to London. He was tried under Elizabethan anti-priest laws and then executed. Jeez. Another priest was found upstairs, and the poor lad was beheaded up there. Oh, the oh, Southers yeah. then made the long, long journey to the Tower of London. The only thing that saved their lives was the fact that fought so well for the King at Agincourt and Flodden Field, but they were literally asset stripped and they lost this beautiful building. It was then sold to a chap called Gail John Braddle, never ever lived here, but what he did do, he, he hired the building out to fly by night tenants, and for a while, this rather beautiful room of standing in was indeed a cattle shed. It then became a public house called the Braddle Arms, and then it became a handloom weaver's factory, and was bought by a family from Leeds, West Yorkshire, called the Harrisons. They turned the building into a school for young ladies for a while, and for 15 long years it was very, very pleasant. You'd hear the sound of children playing and indeed uh, children being educated. When Mrs. Harrison passed away, her husband quickly followed and they left the building to their 21 year old son, James. Now, James could drink for England. <laughs> this guy had so many parties here, he was spending money before he'd even earned it. He would invite people like Charles Dickens here, Rudyard Kipling. They all came here to recite poems to the family. He became insolvent and sadly shot himself upstairs. Shot himself he shot himself. in, in, his, uh, in he his building. He took his own life because he was insolvent. The depression got so great from losing all his wealth that he shot himself upstairs. Okay. So you probably gathered it. With just that short intro, we have more ghosts here than you can shake a stick at. Yeah. And of course, it's my job today to show you the ghosts of Sarsby Hall yeah. and then oh, leave man. you guys to find out exactly <laughs> what is going to happen. All I can say is I'm rather glad I'm not going to spend the night with you, fellas. Yeah, yeah. Oh, 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 but we shall make our way <laughs> next door, <laughs> folks. Please right, follow right. me. This is horrible. Oh my god, that is insane. Look in there. So, we've left 1322. We are now in the main extension from the main hall, built around 1420 by a chap called Thomas Southworth. And there's his name above the fireplace. There's his lovely wife, Anne. Now, there's nothing more Thomas like than sitting in front of a glowing fire with his family, watching them play in the carpet. But being a typical Roman Catholic, he told his wife, when I depart this earth, my dear, will you please carry out my last wishes? And those wishes are to be laid in state for literally two days, a typical Roman Catholic wake. Uh -huh. um, his coffin was placed here in front of the Southworth crest. In one hand he had a bell, in the other hand he had a glass of port. If he woke up he could ring the bell, he heard the expression a dead ringer. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, he could drink the port and they'd realise he was actually pulling their legs. Sadly in his case, he really was dead. We now pick up the story quite a few years later in 1972. The hall has a huge connection with the American War of Independence. One such family arrived from New Jersey, Mr. John Erickson and his wife Edith. As they came to the door there, they saw the mantelpiece here. They started taking lots of photographs and Erickson went back to his home in New Jersey. He handed back the film and three days later came back to look at the photographs before we had digital cameras and skipped for the photographs. And there, to his amazement, he saw on one of those acute angles he'd taken a coffin on a tress and it wasn't there when he took the photograph. I must just point out, folks, because this is so important, the fireplace did look very innocent. Thomas knew the Roman Catholic faith was under a lot of scrutiny. He brought in Nicholas Owen. 
and Nicholas Owen designed this fantastic priest hole. It looks completely innocent, doesn't it, really? But if the Southwest were looking after priests and the army were in the area, they'd bring them down from upstairs, pull back the lever here, and the front of the fireplace would come out on springs and sprockets and slides. In the priests would go, they'd shut the fireplace up again, the army course would search the whole building and find no one. As a result, the army were convinced they were hiding priests but couldn't find them. So therefore they put a scout on a nearby hill and one night he watched a priest arrive, alerted the authorities. The priest was brought in, taken upstairs and given sanctuary. The army surrounded the building, kicked the door down, um, went upstairs to the priest room, which we shall go very, very soon, uh -huh. and executed the poor lad by beheading. We're now gonna make our way back to 1923 and this building was in a terrible state. It was in danger of collapsing. Local builders gathered like a flock of vultures to take away all the stone, all the timber. And on the 11th hour, the Sarnsby Hall Preservation Society were formed and they consisted mainly of entrepreneurs and historians and they saved the building. They can't let any Tom, Dick and Harry work in the hall. It's got to be someone who's highly skilled in medieval buildings. And one such person fitted the build beautifully. Wait for his name, Mr. Michael Palin. You got a ladder, climbed up the ladder, looked at the bosses up there which were hanging really precariously with a hammer and chisel chiseled away and knocked a huge block of stone off. To his horror, standing just here, was a little boy with curly black hair. The little boy shouted, pointed at Mr. Harrison, the, the, the portrait over there, shouting, You shouldn't be here! Mr. Harrison won't like it! You shouldn't be here! Well, I've got a right to be here, lad. You stand back. You could have been badly injured. Yeah, well. He turned round, climbed up the ladder, the little boy gone. Strange. Must be a quick runner. For the next five months, they worked their socks off, bringing new timber, new tiles, and Sarsby Hall was beginning to look a bit like itself once again. They arrived as usual for another hard day's graft on a bitterly cold December day, 1923. Michael looked out of the window, and the blue sky disappeared. Replacing it came these huge clouds full of snow, and a wind whipped up, which howled right around the hall. Heavy, heavy snow came down from the heavens, and Michael assembled his four apprentices. I'm sorry, boys, there's no way we'll get home tonight. We'll have to go into the forest, it'll be dark by 4.30, we'll get this fire going and we'll spend the night here. The four boys complained, it was getting towards Christmas, they needed to be with their families, but they looked out the window and this was a blizzard of huge proportions. The four of them got their bedrolls out, rolled them out and fell into a deep sleep. And Michael got his bedroll here when he turned to the right and saw a golden glowing light just beneath the king at the door entrance there. Out of that golden glowing light stepped a very, very beautiful young lady in Tudor dress. She elegantly made her way past Palin, through the sleeping apprentices, and put her hand on the south of the crest. Palin, from his vantage point here, heard her say the words, I pray my husband will survive this conflict. Then she shimmered, crackled, and left a very, very sweet scent. His heart accelerates in his chest. He turns for the second time to look at the door and sees another golden glowing light. And out that golden glowing light, stepped a 1642 Cavalier officer, typical English Civil War, bandlers across his chest, goatee beard, wart under his eye, feathers in his cap. He walked straight through Palin. He too put his hand on the south of the crest and Palin heard him utter the words, I will survive this war. He then shimmered and disappeared. By now, Michael from his vantage point here is getting very, very traumatized. He swallowed, he gingerly, nervously turned for the third time to look at the door and saw a smaller glowing light. And out of that glowing light appeared the little boy with the curly black hair that had nearly been hit by the boss in June of that year. The boy ran straight past Palin, through the sleeping apprentice and out of the wall to our left. As you can imagine, Michael did not sleep very well that night. We're now gonna go next door, folks, and we shall make our way to the chapel. Please follow me. By far the most recorded story you're gonna hear tonight, and by far the most popular ghost here at Sarsby Hall is the most recognised one. And I've met many people who've come across this ghost and I've met many, many people uh, from different, um, shall we say, situations that can refer to her, including police officers, um, motorists, and indeed uh, staff that work here. We are gonna turn the clock back now to the year 1584 and living here was a very, very beautiful young girl called Dorothea Southworth. She woke up and she made her way across the manicured lawns of Sarsby Hall. She made her way over the moat and into the forest and there she met a handsome young lad 
called De Horton from Horton Towers. Horton Towers is an equally gorgeous building about four miles away. A gorgeous building, the home of the Horton family. So boy meets girl, girl meets boy, landowner meets landowner. It seems like a relationship made in heaven, but a huge problem for Dorothea. She came back and told her mum and dad, we are Catholics, they are Protestants. You will never ever see him again. If you do, I'll have you banished. You live with the nuns of the south of France. We're Catholics, they are Protestants. The poor girl was horrified. If anything, the threat fueled her, their love. In the dead of night, she'd make her way across the lawns, over the moat and into the forest and meet young Dee Horton. Her father warned her again, if you continue with this relationship, I'll have you sent to Marseille to live with the nuns. We are Catholics. He will never, ever have my permission to take your hand in marriage. On a beautiful moonlit night, she left her bed upstairs in the long gallery. She made her way past what she thought were her sleeping brothers, her sleeping parents, and she tiptoed down the stairs, over the, the lawns, over the moat, and into the forest. There, illuminated in bright, bright moonlight, was young Dee Horton. When he saw her, he very, very politely bowed, he affectionately kissed her hand, reached into his pocket and produced a huge engagement ring. Dorothy, will you end this heartache and become my wife? A huge smile came across her face and she gratefully, gratefully accepted the proposal of marriage. They hugged each other on the fringe of the forest. Then they heard shouting and screaming. And out of the forest appeared Dorothea's two brothers, both armed with two very, very sharp knives. They cruelly, maliciously murdered young Dee Horton right in front of her. The poor girl's heart was snapped in two. The tears streamed down her cheeks. She was brought back to this very, very room, the chapel, and placed under house arrest. The following morning, her cruel father had her sent to live with the nuns in the south of France. On arriving there, she never drank again, she never slept again, she never ate again, and she died literally of a broken heart. That's when the famous sightings of the White Lady Salisbury have taken place here at Salisbury Hall. By far the most interesting story that related to her took place in 1926, when the road to our right was widened to take more heavier traffic. And as the engineers came down towards Salisbury Hall, they knew the old moat had been filled in, but they thought, it's still a little bit unstable. They put what's called the herringbone drainage system across the lawns. Um, one of the trenches went in between the horse chestnut and the yew tree, and just two feet beneath the surface, they found the foot of an adult skeleton. Blackman CID were brought in. Uh, they excavated the grave and they said, it's definitely a murder, but I don't think we'll catch the culprit. This lad has been here for at least 400 years. Some more work took place in the grave they found a ring on one of the fingers, a huge ring. It was removed, carefully inspected, and had the words inside, Dorothea D. Horton. It was none other than young D. Horton, who'd been murdered all those years ago by Lady Dorothea's two brothers. And that would explain why the White Lady of Sarsby will make her way to the only grave of the only boy that ever showed her any love, any warmth, and any affection. Oh wow, oh my god. With the lights turned off, this is gonna be horrific. And why is there mannequins? <laughs> really amazing stories. Um, that? That? Sorry, what? Are we hearing bangs already? It wouldn't surprise me the slightest. Rudyard Kipling loved this room. Charles Dickens loved this room. They say that Charles Dickens got the idea of the old curiosity shop from this very, very room here. When the Harrisons uh, lived here, they of course would think nothing of inviting top celebrities to entertain the whole family. And it's with the Harrison family we're gonna get our next story. Just here is the remains of a 45 service Colt revolver bullet. That's deeply, mad. deeply embedded. Oh, wow, um, that's crazy. A very, very sad story behind it. 1878, the butler, a chap called Mr. John Fresh, and came at the very stairs you've just come up. He had a silver tray on that tray. He had a letter. Harrison opened this lovely crisp white letter. It came from the Scottish bank informing him that he'd lost absolutely everything and the Scottish bank had indeed collapsed. He owned the hall. He owned the land around the hall, but he also, yeah, yeah, I got that as well. Sorry. <laughs> but he also um, had textile facts in Blackman, Burnley, Nelson and Cone. But for some terribly sad reason, this young boy of 21 reached for the bureau, opened the bureau door 
and brought up the 45 service Colt revolver. He loaded the chamber, placed the barrel to his temple. He pulled the trigger, the bullet went through his cranium, through his brain, embedded there, and the poor lad fell to the floor, as dead oh. as a doornail. Now, downstairs, you'll find a lady called Sharon. Uh, she's a very brave woman, exceptionally brave woman. She's the events manager here at Sarsby Hall. It's her job when everyone's gone home to turn all the lights off, put the burglar alarms on, and she is armed with a torch. As she goes from one room to the next, she will turn the lights off. Yeah. As she's walked down the long gallery, it hasn't happened every night, mm -hmm. but it's happened at least 15 times in the last 20 years, when she's stopped and she's heard... Then the hair has been tugged behind her. Uh, when, when I started doing this tour, she said, son, it's very, very likely if you've got any ladies with blonde hair, they'll get their hair tugged. I said, Sharon, I'm not going to buy that one. <laughs> but I've seen it happen on many occasions. And the one thing I always do is look behind them to see if there's someone there. Yeah. And when you don't see someone there, it's a bit of a shock. Oh, man. I get, I get weird vibes from this room. Welcome to the priest's room. This room was literally built by the South of Family for the priests. Of course, they'd arrive on the shores of Lancashire, come inland, and the Southwest would look after them. The army always had suspicion on this family, but each time they raided the building, they couldn't find anyone. You saw Nicholas Owen's priest held downstairs. It worked really, really well. So therefore, the army put a scout on a nearby hill. A priest arrived. He was soaking wet, he made his way inland, and he went to the door downstairs. Hammered on the door, the South was welcomed him. He was brought up here, given a change of clothing, a nice warm meal. He had no idea he had brought the army with him. They surrounded Sarsby Hall. Five soldiers broke the door in downstairs, and uh, they um, arrested the South of family. They came upstairs, found the young boy in deep prayer. He was executed by beheading in this very, very room. The headless corpse is taken downstairs and placed on the lawns outside. The Southers have to lie down with their hands tapping on their backs and they make the long journey to the Tower of London. The only thing that will save them is the fact they'd fought so well for the King at Agincourt and Flodden Field, but they were assets stripped. The floor here, as you can imagine, was not pleasant. It was smeared with blood. When the Braddell family purchased the building, they tried to clean the floor, but to no avail. The blood just wouldn't go. So therefore they thought, let's just brick it up. It was bricked up until the year 1868 when the Harrison family purchased the building. Saw the floor was still smeared with medieval blood and they thought, we don't believe this superstitious rubbish, we're having those floorboards taken away immediately. And they had some new Victorian boards inserted. But as you look, and if you were to have a mobile phone and take a photograph, you'll find a stain right here. Yeah, I can see that. If you were to take a photograph, you'll find a stain. Wait, yeah, I can see it. I can a see a bit blur. Oh, one sec, hold on. Many people uh, feel this is the most paranormal room at Salisbury Hall. Next story I'm going to tell you, it's one of the most famous stories relating to witchcraft in Great Britain and does involve Sarsby Hall. And we'll have that just next door, guys, thank you. 1603, at that period of time, we had a fantastic Queen of the Throne of England called Queen Elizabeth I. Led by example, loved by the people of England. When she died in 1603, she was replaced by King James VI of Scotland, who then became King James I of England. And this guy was absolutely paranoid about witchcraft. He not only believed that witches existed, he believed they were actually out to get him. On becoming King of England, he wrote a book called The Demonology Book. You can buy it today from any leading bookshop as you pick it up. How to find a witch, how to try a witch, and most importantly, how to eradicate a witch. Throughout the whole length of Great Britain, an area very, very near to where we are now, called Pendle Hill, stuck out like a sore thumb. It was surrounded by a huge forest. It was away from society. The area was predominantly Catholic and still is to this very, very day. And he blamed the gunpowder plot of 605 on witchcraft. And he blamed the Catholics uh, to be aligned with witches. So therefore he gave orders that every illegal Catholic gathering must be dealt with immediately. Uh, caught up in all this Syria were various people from the forest of Pendle. It's a long, long story, this one, guys. So I'll try and condense it, otherwise I'll be here for a long, long time. <laughs> But basically, the following people were found guilty of witchcraft in the Forest of Pendle. Elizabeth Southern, Anne Whittle, Anne Redfern, Elizabeth Device, James Device, Jeanette Device, Alison Device, Catherine Hewitt, Alice Gray, John and Jane Bullcock, Margaret Pearson, and Alice Nutter. They were all sent to Lancaster and York and found guilty of having dogs. Tib, Ball, 
fancy dandy, which gave them special powers. That it, door's just open by itself. Oh my right. goodness, yes. Like, Indeed. Yeah. <laughs> the, no breeze. Uh, there's no breeze. Well, there's no breeze. It hasn't affected that door, has What's it? That noise down here? Yeah. It is very atmospheric up here. Uh, there's a lot of like energy in this building. You can you can definitely feel it. Yeah. All I can say is I'm you glad that, it's open. I'm glad that you three are here because I would not like to be here by myself. Really? I would be honestly. I would not like to be here by myself now. We've had these three young ladies arrested for witchcraft. Jane Southworth, the white lady's eldest um, sister, Jean and Ellen Braley, and they're sent to Lancaster as well. Uh, they're having a, a meal next door and are sent to Lancaster. They are put in the cells next to the Pendle witches. Uh, they hear this huge roar on the 20th of August, 1612. And uh, Jane climbs to the shelves of her two friends, looks out of the window of the cell, and there she can see the Pendle witches actually on the pillory. They're standing on trestles, they've got their hands behind their backs, and she watches in horror as someone kicks the trestles out from underneath them. These people do not hang, they strangle to death. Uh, she then hears the sound of footsteps that get louder and louder and louder. I can assure you that was not fake, folks, I can assure you. <laughs> yeah. uh, the cell door is opened, and there's Mr. Thomas Caval, the head jailer of Lancaster City Castle. Right, you three, just dealt with that lot. It's your turn next. Follow me. The three of them must have been terrified as they made their way into the courts, the same courts that had just dispatched the Pendle witches. They stood in front of James Oltham, Edmund Bromley, Thomas Potts, Roger Noel, William Holden, John Bannister. The jury were all male, and the prosecution were all male. There was no defence counsel because no one dared defend the, the Pendle Witches. No one dared take on the King of England. The case of the Pendle Witches, they used a little girl called Jeanette Device to incriminate her whole family, but she'd been groomed by the local magistrate. The same thing happened with the uh, Salisbury Hall Witches. They brought in a little girl called Gracie, and Gracie used to live in this very, very room. She was the head gardener's daughter. She was only seven years old. She's brought to Lancaster City Castle, picked up and put on top of a desk so the jury can see her. And the judges say, right young lady, read out your testimony against these three witches. Uh, well, sir, um, I was swimming down, uh, walking down the river ribble, sir. I saw three um, people from Sarsby Hall, Jane Southworth and the two Braley girls, that were swimming in the river, sir. I then saw these unusual dogs, Tib, Ball, Fancy, Dandy. I had never seen the breed before, sir. They jumped into the river, materialised into human beings and picked up all three women, danced in a circle and paired off for a meal. On the second day, Ellen Braley came to see me. She changed from a woman into a dog and tried to suffocate me under a blanket of straw, but I escaped. On the third day, the three of them came to see me. We'd like to have some fun, Gracie. I said, what do you mean by fun? A little boy has been born at Sarsby Hall. In this corner here. That door, folks, that is quite awesome, isn't it? Yeah, it's yeah. moving back yeah. and forth yeah. constantly. And uh, she also mentioned that um, they'd asked her if, they'd, if she would like to join them in the murder of a little boy called Thomas Walshman, who was actually in the long gallery. He was sleeping, he was only two years old, um, a little baby boy. And uh, Grace said, why do you want to eat him? Well, he hasn't been christened. No, I don't want to do that. James Orton, the senior judge at Lancaster, picked up the gavel. We find your guilt, you'll die like the rest. Before the gavel came down, his companion Bromley said, no, 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 let her finish her testimony. Sir, in the dead of night, they came up to the long gallery where the little boy was sleeping. He was picked up from the bed um, over three nights, they pricked his stomach and consumed his blood. He was then buried at Salisbury Church. On the third day, sir, they went back and dug up the body. They boiled the baby's flesh, they consumed the flesh, they kept some body that would enable them to change shape. And uh, that's when James Arthur picked the gavel. We fight, you will die like the rest before the gavel came down. James South have pulled off a miracle. Sir, I beg of you, sir, to cross-examine this young girl, sir. She has been manipulated by a Catholic priest hiding at Salisbury Hall. Just that one word, Catholicism, made the judges sit back. Uh, you're an Anglican, you say? I am, sir. I am married in the South of the family. They've never liked me because of my Anglican views, sir. Please cross-examine her. They took Grace next door. Uh, James Oltham, Edmund Bromley, Thomas Potts, Roger Noel, William Hopton and John Bannister. That door really is getting freaky, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. it's got more aggressive so, since we so got in here as well. It yeah, does, very trashly. Um, you can actually feel a bit of tension. I'm not just saying this. You can actually feel the tension as, uh, mm -hmm. as I tell the story, because it came from this very, very room yeah. in 1612. Gracie came back in tears, and the judges reassembled the court. In the light of new evidence, we find you, Jane Southworth, you, Jean and Ellen Braley, innocent 
of the crimes against you. They came back to this very, very room and had the party of all parties. But the story doesn't really finish there because for many, many centuries, historians have argued between the Pendle Witches and the Sandville Witches. We do know they were tried on the same day, the 20th of August, 1612, City of Lancaster by James Altham, Edmund Bromley, Thomas Fox, Roger Noel, William Holden and John Bannister. Uh, we also know that um, two doctors met uh, 200 years later, Whitaker and Dawson, and they discussed both cases. And Whitaker said to Dawson, I believe young Grace was telling the truth. How? Well, the way she's described those dogs in the River Ribble sound like the dogs that belong to Anne Redfern, Anne Whittle, Elizabeth Southern and Alison Devise, the Pendle Witches. She's described them perfectly and she would not have been in court that day. Um, also, let's get permission to exhume the Walshman grave. They wrote to York Minster. York sent uh, the Reverend John Franks to Sarnsby and he got the grave records and he pasted at exactly the right location and started to dig. Two feet beneath the surface they found a loss in shaped Charles Coffin. Under Church of England jurisdiction it was opened and found to contain nothing. So who knows, young Grace may just have been telling the truth. As you can imagine, at night time this, this building really can be very, very spooky. Uh, I've never been here by myself, but I'd like to um, advise you all to stick together tonight because things do go bump in the night here. Yeah, we'll, sta we'll stay together. Yeah, we'll, yeah, we won't let nobody... You must stay together because uh, yeah. I think it can have an effect on people. Yeah, definitely, yeah. definitely. Yeah. You become vulnerable when you're by yourself in a place like this. Now the story's finished, the door has also stopped opening and closing. Now I can assure you, uh, we have not planned this, it has just happened, but that's what happens here at Sarsby Hall. Things do go bump in the night. And I'll be leaving you chaps to go and find it for yourself. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you so much, okay. appreciate it. My Amazing. pleasure.